Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Dennis Stone, Director of the Center for Advocacy and Social Justice at the Urban League. Welcome to our monthly conversation on racial healing and reconciliation. And tonight our guest, uh, someone who has spent his whole life in Jacksonville and has had some major leadership roles, Nat Glover, uh, president of Edward Waters College, former sheriff, um, and playing other leadership roles um, as he even does now. Um, I would like, uh, uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, I've asked him to speak for about 30 minutes and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, but if you want to send me any questions in the chat, you can do that as well. So with that, um, President Glover, um, the dais is yours. Oh, <clears throat> thank you, Dennis. Certainly, I'm honored to be here for this uh, um, event and um, gives me an opportunity to talk uh, pretty much about my life. Um, and um, actually, um, I've been doing quite a bit of that uh, lately because I just um, launched uh, my memoir in um, August of this year. And of course, I've been to a number of events where I was talking uh, about the book and what's and what's in it. And just for a reference, the book is on Amazon and it the name of it is Striving for Justice, a Black Sheriff in the Deep South. And it talks, uh, it being my memoir, it talks about my life. And really it kind of starts off with the challenges I had when I was young. Um, I happen to be, um, feel like I was blessed to have um, uh, two parents, uh, both of which were quite committed to making certain that um, we, and I'm talking my uh, sisters and my brother, uh, all were, um, I'm going to say, use the term in general, good people, but they were also committed to us um, at least getting a high school um, education. And, um, but we had limited resources and we ended up uh, for the most part uh, living uh, in what people call uh, then the ghettos of Jacksonville. Um, it was a brother, a mother, father, and three sisters. And we lived in a two room house that was called a shotgun house. And the reason they call it a shotgun house was because you could take a, uh, a shotgun and shoot through the front door and it will go out the back door without any of the pellets hitting anything. So um, it was under uh, uh, those conditions we um, existed. And of, of course, as, as long as I can remember, I um, always wanted to be a police officer. And the reason I, uh, I guess started when I uh, we didn't have a television, so I, I was listening to the radio and I always uh, listened to the detective stories, uh, Dragnet and, and all of the private detective stories. And so I, my ambition was always to be a detective. And uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, achieve that. And they're very, very 
appreciative that I was, but we'll get to that um, a little bit later. But the implications of race uh, was pretty obvious in my neighborhood because I lived in a neighborhood where uh, there were a number of people in the neighborhood. I'm gonna say a number, but uh, there were at least two people in the neighborhood selling uh, what was then called moonshine. It was illegal whiskey. And of course, um, it was obvious that they were not the subject of any uh, prevention, uh, arrest, um, and the police uh, frequently came in the neighborhood and went in the, the, the houses where they were selling um, moonshine and, and they left without taking any enforcement. Now, I had no evidence to know what was going on or what was said, but everybody in the neighborhood pretty much thought then that the police officers were, of course, being paid off not to enforce. And it 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 looked kind of peculiar. And so that was pretty much my image of what uh, police officers um, do. And, and, um, and it certainly was not uh, a good image. But um, uh, I did um, get an opportunity to, um, to go to school. And I think that was um, my salvation. And to be honest with you, I also um, um, had a challenge at one time. I I, uh, I went to my mother and um, I had a proposition for her because I, at that time, was only one of the few people in the neighborhood that was going to school every day in my peer group. Uh, they were not going and quite often they thought it was funny that I had to go every day. So they and seemed to have been doing pretty good. One had a, uh, always had a pocket full of money. One had a car and the other had a girlfriend. I didn't have none of that. And I was the only one going to school. So I went to my mother and I said to her, mom, um, I, I would like to ask you something. And I was going to uh, make the proposition of if I can quit school, then maybe I can have a car or some money and, and uh, a girlfriend. And she didn't uh, allow me to finish the statement. She said, if you're going to stay in this house, you're going to school. And to this day, I think it saved my life because I'm almost certain where many of my peers ended up either in a cemetery or jail, I probably would have ended up the same place. But I was working uh, uh, part-time job and I had a tremendous work ethic because my parents insisted that that was the case. And what they, what they made certain that we learned was whatever we did, do it at a level where people will recognize you doing it better than your peers. And, and, and with that, I took that with me um, as I even um, got part-time jobs. And one of the part-time jobs I got, uh, I was hired uh, by Morrison Cafeteria um, Management uh, and of course, I was still in school, so I, I was um, going to school uh, and during the week. And on the weekend, I worked at Morrison Cafeteria in the dish room. And I had one of the uh, episodes in my life that 
I could make a legitimate case that shaped my life. And, and, and that is one uh, Saturday, I was confronted with a mob of ax handle weaving in the white races after I got off work. And all of this happened on what is known in Jacksonville now as Axe Handle Saturday. And just to give you a little background on that, I was um, um, working on that Saturday. My days of working were Saturday and Sunday. And you had some sit-in demonstrators came to downtown Jacksonville to conduct sit-in demonstrations at Woolworth, which was across the street, Catacona, from um, Morrison Cafeteria. And, but this Saturday, when they came down to conduct the sit-in demonstrations, and they had been doing them on a regular basis in downtown Jacksonville. Well, on this particular Saturday, you had some white supremacists and Ku Klux Klansmen came to downtown Jacksonville to put a stop to those demonstrations. And they were going to confront those demonstrators. Now, just as a note here, I did not know what was going on because I am working. But, um, and, and the whole notion was when they came to town, they were all issued brand new ax handles. And that's what they were going to use to assault the demonstrators. And, and so when the demonstrators went into Woolworth to conduct the sit-in demonstrations, and the sit-in demonstrations simply were being conducted by the, 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 the youth group of the NAACP because black folks were not allowed to sit at the lunch counters um, to have lunch. Um, I thought they said that you can go to the end of the counter and maybe order something, but you certainly couldn't sit down. But those demonstrators would go and sit at the lunch counter. And what that would effectively do was shut down the lunch counter. And of course, um, when they did that, they were attacked by those individuals with the ax handles and they ran them out of town. Now I was in Morrison cafeteria uh, washing dishes, of course, and the boss came down and told us to drop what we're doing and get out of town because they knew what was going on outside. And so when um, my job was to mop the floor after everybody left, that was my job. So everybody left but me. And he actually told all of us to leave, but I, because of this work ethic I mentioned earlier, I just couldn't leave until I mopped the floor and I did. So I left an hour after everybody else had, had already gone. And when I came out after that hour, I was the only black person in downtown Jacksonville. And I was immediately surrounded by those individuals with the ax handles. And they calling me names and they started to hit me with the ax handles and and I was caught kind of in the middle of a circle where they were just hitting me. And I did see a police officer standing outside of the circle of individuals, but he was he took the spectators, I guess, position. He was just watching. And I, 
I ran to him and I said, please help me. And he said to me, I'll never forget these words. You better get out of here before they kill you. And I ran and I ran all the way home, which was about uh, more than a mile from downtown Jacksonville. And, um, but I survived because I could have died that day and it would have been nothing less than a it would have been a lynching, no question. It would have been a modern day lynching. But when I got home, I cried and and I cried most of the rest of that day. And I wasn't crying because I was hurt. I was crying because I ran. Because in my neighborhood, you didn't run away from a fight. You either fought and took a beating or you did anything but run. And I was so embarrassed, ashamed. So at the end of the day, I made this promise to myself. I said that I will never run away from another fight, another confrontation. I would rather die than run away and feel like I was feeling. And to be honest, that set the tone for my life. And to this day, I feel like that whatever I feel like I need to do, if there's any indication that it might be perceived to me or anybody else that I didn't do it because I was afraid to do it, I have to do it. And I make certain I don't get to a position where I don't do something because I'm afraid uh, I, I do something because I'm afraid not to do it. And um, I, I, I acquired this mentality of being a person that run to the fire rather than from the fire. And that have paid off in my life and have in many ways helped me to distinguish myself as a law enforcement officer. So that was my first or uh, second, um, I'm going to say, uh, blatant uh, exposure to um, racism. But I survived it. I survived it. And in a strange way, it made me a better person. Now, fact of the matter is, I had another misfortunate incident um, while I was working at Morrison. I got off work one night around nine o'clock. I was stopped by uh, two police officers, detectives, and they happened to be searching everybody that came out of Morrison. And they, when they searched me, they found two napkins, the napkins that you wrap the silver up with, and in my back pocket. And they asked me some questions, which I didn't know the answer to. I really didn't. And they said if I didn't tell them who were stealing um, sirloin steaks in the from the cafeteria that they were going to put they were going to put me in jail and i didn't know and they arrested me for those two napkins now here i am i am being arrested uh being put in jail i have this ambition to be a police officer and to become a detective and i'm a being arrested for stealing two napkins and that was 
a huge setback. Now, I'm going to say that I don't think that uh, those police officers would have arrested a white person. Um, and many says that they were racist, but I also have to look at it the other way. I did have the napkins in my pocket and they were napkins that um, came from the cafeteria, but we used the napkins for, for handkerchiefs and it really had never been that big a deal, but um, was arrested. But um, when, I, when I went before the judge that Monday morning, the judge uh, discharged the case. And that was because the manager came down to testify on my behalf from Morrison and my father's uh, employer, who was also white, came down and testified on my behalf about the family. So I reaped the benefit of that. And the judge, John E. Santora, actually discharged the case and said to me, he did not want to see me down there again, ever. And I always appreciated that. But it was also on my record that I was arrested, which at that particular time, they were not anxious to hire black police officers so it it was could very well have been um I, I i was possibly may not have been able to be hired but later on after i finished college and I applied to become a police officer um nothing happened and i know what it was it was my arrest record but I can tell you that I got some help because um, one of the black officers found out that I was not being hired after my application because of my arrest record. He took me to see the mayor, which was Lou Ritter. And Mayor Lou Ritter went down to the Civil Service Administration office and said he wanted to have Nathaniel Glover take the test to become a police officer. And the administrator said, we saw his application and we know he has finished college and all of that, but he has an arrest record and we don't hire people who've been in jail and to become police officers. And he also told the mayor, and oh, by the way, Mr. Mayor, the Civil Service Administration Office worked for the Civil Service Board, not the mayor. And Mayor Lou Ritter threatened, I would say he was not so subtle in telling that administrator that he realized that the board is the oversight entity of the Civil Service Administration, but he was also looking at reappointing some new board members. And to this day, I think that was the only reason that I was hired to become a police officer. And later on, I was able to attain a level of detective and eventually be elected sheriff in this city. 
Now, I have to tell you, that whole journey were littered with discrimination, uh, but we were able, was able to overcome. And I'm going to say I was able to overcome with, to some degree, a lot of help from good white people. And I don't back off of and not am I apprehensive about uh, mentioning that because as I said earlier, my boss who happened to be white when he came to testify in court for me and my father's boss came to testify about my family, I have to say that was a big deal. And I don't minimize the impact that it had. And throughout my career in the sheriff's office, there were those who um, actually um, or do things to actually hold me back. To be honest with you, every time that I was up for a promotion, they would go and find my mugshot that I was arrested on and post it on the wall in the sheriff's office and put notes under it. So now we are promoting ex-offenders and all of that. But um, I had to overcome that. But I got promoted to uh, detective and then the, and then I made detective sergeant and I was the first supervisor of color that was assigned white subordinates. So I had uh, um, six detectives who were working under my supervision um, and only one was African-American. And those detectives were so good and were so effective in working in the burglary unit that it raised me to a level of being recognized as police officer of the year in the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office and police officer of the year by the Jacksonville JCs in Jacksonville, the Brotherhood of Police Officers. That's a black organization in um, the Sheriff's Office, police officers and Florida Retail Association. I was a runner up for their police officer of the year. So uh, of course, while there were those who were actually trying to, you know, hold me back because I was African-American, I also uh, reaped the benefit of diligent, competent detectives that um, raised my performance and leadership up to a level where it was recognized. And as you know, um, when I got to a point in my career and the current sheriff, uh, Jim McMillan, uh, indicated that he was going to retire, I was also encouraged to run for sheriff. Now, running for sheriff in Jacksonville, Florida, or anywhere in the state of Florida for an African-American, you would be running against history because at that time, it was thought that any African-American sheriff elected in the state of Florida would be the first African-American elected in the state of Florida. Now, after I was elected, of course, we found that I was the first African-American elected in the state of Florida. 
since 1888, but it was still a historic moment in, in Jacksonville. And when people were trying to encourage me to run, there were twice as many people who were trying to discourage me from running because uh, they indicated that I would only embarrass myself getting out thinking that the citizens of Jacksonville would elect a black sheriff. Maybe if you were in Orlando or maybe if you were in Miami, they, they might consider it, but not here in Jacksonville. And I can tell you, I did run and the records will show that I was elected and elected in the first primary. And after my election, I made it clear, clear that uh, I was not going to let the citizens of Jacksonville down. And to this day, I use all kinds of innovative approaches to um, law enforcement and was able to reduce crime for the eight years I was in office in Jacksonville, Florida, 17.1%. And one of the highlights of my career, the president of the United States, along with the attorney general and the governor of Florida, came down to Jacksonville, Florida to walk through a neighborhood with me. And that won me the kind of distinction that gave me credibility, not only with the people in Jacksonville, but my peers throughout the state. And while I've had to overcome the challenges of racism and uh, so many instances that I can say was apparent, I will say that I also got help from people who actually were of a different color, but very, very supportive. And while as I look at things, we can look at the things that happen that's racist in nature, there have been so many incidents in Jacksonville, Florida that we can be proud of. And that's pretty much my perspective on race here in Jacksonville. Well, thank you so much, President Clever, sharing those experiences. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions now. Um, and I'll start off and, and say, uh, and ask you this, as you progressed, um, did you see any changes in people's attitudes um, and in, in terms of, uh, let's put it, the racist perspective. And what were some of the things that helped make that change happen, if it did happen? Well, one of the things that I think that helped with my election um, when um, my name came up in a press conference with the then sheriff, um, Jim McMillan, who was sheriff at the time, and I was contemplating running. He was asked um, about who he was supporting. And of course, everybody knew he and I were very good friends and we were in the academy together and he got asked a question about why he wasn't considering supporting me and the reason why he wasn't supporting me was the fact that I wasn't in the race and the other two people that was already in the race he had made his selection on who he was going to support and so um 
And one of his comments were, of course, when he was asked that question, he said he wasn't certain that Jacksonville had progressed to the point where they would elect a black chair. And, and that caused um, a number of people to um, feel like he, he had called them out to some degree. So in a funny way, uh, I would use the term peculiar way, I think um, that put the question on the table as a, at a level where I think the people kind of felt like, oh, we're going to say it's because of his race that we don't vote for him. And I, I think I might have benefited from some of the votes because uh, history will tell that I got elected in the first primary with about 55% of the vote. And that was against two candidates who raised twice as much money as I raised. And I was elected. And of course, after that election, I think to this day, Jacksonville kind of moved forward as it related to uh, putting African-Americans in leadership positions. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now so that um, questions may come up that wouldn't ordinarily come up when the recording is on. Okay.